Welcome to Medicine in Our Backyard. This is a series that's presented by the Newport Beach Public Library Foundation. My name is Adrian Windsor. I am on the board of the foundation and I'm happy to welcome you here tonight. Uh, before I talk about the foundation, I'm supposed to let you know what we have coming up so that you're sure to be here. On November 26th, we have Dr. Shaista Malik, who is going to be talking about activating resiliency against stress, inflammation, and heart disease. So tonight you learn how to age and not be frail. Next week, you'll, next, uh, the 26th, you'll learn how not to be stressed <laughs> and avoid heart disease. Uh, we are kicking off our library live this Thursday. We have uh, actually quite a famous surfer and conservationist. His name is Serge Dedina. He is the uh, mayor of Olympic Beach, and he's going to be talking about conservation. And then on November 8th, we have Jonathan Bloom, who will be speaking on food waste and how we can make a difference to reduce food waste. Maybe even more exciting, uh, we have a special guest, Bill Bracken, who will be introducing him. He was the chef at the Four Seasons Hotel, and he now is working on repurposing food, and he's going to have a food truck. So you don't want to miss that. You should be here for that. All right, so now let me tell you a little bit about the foundation. How many of you are members of the foundation? Oh, that's fabulous. Okay, good. Because we sponsor the Witty Lecture Series, we sponsor the Library Live, several other programs, including this one tonight. The chairs you are sitting on were donated by the Foundation, our uh, state-of-the-art media lab, we have computer desks upstairs, we have just finished digitalizing the daily pilot. So we try to fill in gaps that are left for the library when the city doesn't fund certain things. And every year they come to us with a wish list. So when you are a member, you are supporting that and you are supporting our work. So it's important for us to have you become a member. We have a table at the back of the room. And uh, if you aren't a member, we'd love to have you stop by. And standing by that table right now is our new director of programs, Kunga. You want to see her? <laughs> this is Kungo Wangmo Upshaw, and she uh, is our new program director. She comes to us with a tremendous amount of experience, and we're all very excited to have her with us. Now, we want to thank our sponsors, Mike and Polly Smith, and I'm going to ask you to stand up, please, and be acknowledged. <laughs> Mike and Polly not only have contributed uh, financially to the sponsorship of this program, they were essentially the initiators of it. I had the privilege to be at a meeting at the uh, Gross Eye Clinic when Dr. Steiner, the late Dr. Steiner, was still alive and he did a presentation. And at the end of it, Mike and Polly said, you know, it'd be wonderful if we could get something going with UCI. And that is how Medicine in Your Backyard was born. And ever since then, we've had this fantastic source resource coming to us from UCI, from the health department, uh, there to give us these wonderful speakers. So we're very grateful to you for your leadership and your uh, inspiration and your vision, <laughs> all of those things. All right, now uh, we're going to have a Q&A session at the end of this, so please hold your questions. Uh, if you haven't turned off your cell phone, I haven't turned mine off yet, but uh, please do it right now. And I'm so pleased to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Lisa Gibbs. Dr. Gibbs was awarded the Physician of the Year Award in 2017 by the Orange County Medical Association. She is a clinical professor in the Department of Family Medicine and chief of the Division of Geriatric Medicine and Gerontology at the UCI School of Medicine. 
She also serves as medical director of the UCI Health, Senior Health in Orange. A longtime leader in senior health advocacy, Dr. Gibbs heads numerous research and training projects designed to support successful aging, that's why we're all here, including comprehensive agile response team for dementia care to address the glaring need for better care for those suffering from dementia in our aging society. Dr. Gibbs attended medical school at Stanford and completed her residency at UC, uh, uh, UC Davis. She is certified in family medicine and in ge ger geriatrics by the American Board of Family Medicine. She will be speaking us tonight on frailty and healthy aging. Please help me welcome Dr. Gibbs. Well, thank you. Thank you for the invitation from the foundation uh, to speak here tonight. Uh, thanks again to Mike and Polly Smith for their support. Uh, it's always great to be able to, to get out into the, our community and talk about geriatrics and all the things that we love to do. Uh, so I appreciate the opportunity. So tonight, um, I was asked to speak about some of our, one of our studies um, involving stem cells, which, uh, which deals with the subject of frailty. Uh, but we really can't speak about frailty without talking about the flip side, which is healthy aging. Um, so, and I think much more of us are interested in how to age successfully and how to age well. So that's what I'd really like to concentrate on. And then I'll move into the subject of frailty and some about our stem cell research. Um, and then a few tips about living healthier longer. Uh, not, just, not just from my own experience, you know, seeing patients for the past 15 years, but also from the evidence in the literature. So, okay. um, I think most of you um, know and have been knowing this for many, many years, uh, but I always like to show the Orange County trends in aging. This graph really shows that the only population increasing from now until 2040 is the population over 65. All other age groups in this county will be decreasing in numbers. Okay, So this gives you some idea of, of what, what we need to prepare for. Um, and we are actually part of um, an Orange County Collaborative, which is one of probably 15 to 20 nonprofit and governmental organizations looking for how to prepare the county for aging in the next 10, 20 years. So in Orange County, one in four adults will be over 65 by 2040. So that's a pretty powerful block of people, right? And I think, you know, all of us involved in looking forward to how to prepare for this are talking about age-friendly societies, age-friendly communities. Um, we are actually working very closely with the Alzheimer's Association or Al Alzheimer's OC um, to understand what the needs will be in the next 20, 10 to 20 years. And these are just some examples. Um, we know transportation is one of, one of the most important problems that we need to solve. Because when we ask folks, you know, why is it that they were not able to attend their medical appointment? Or they're not, not able to get the services or the nutrition that they needed? Most of the time it's a transportation problem. So we're looking ahead at, at how to solve that. Uh, caregiving is a major issue with dementia on the rise, right? Uh, we understand that the resources and education needed for caregivers will be tremendous. We tell our patients and our families that we know that caregiving is one of the hardest things they will ever, ever do. And so we need to support these folks. Uh, I, I left medical care for, for the last topic. And again, this is, these are just three of many, many, many areas that we will need to prepare for in the next 10 to 20 years. Uh, but medical care is, of course, close to our hearts because we, we did a, um, an evaluation with the public health department, said, how many geriatricians do you think Orange County needs now? Okay, this is the sixth most populous county in the country. Okay. How many? Oh, oh, we are, yeah, in the country, we are the sixth most populous with three million people in one county. Well, right now, we need about 177 geriatricians right now. And 
in the past couple of years, we counted 50. And 50% how, and of those folks were probably going to retire in the next five years. Okay, so we're getting into some desperate numbers. And UCI, we're, we're doing our part. We're graduating, uh, will be three fellows per year, and we hope that they stay in Orange County to care for our populations. Um, but I just, just sort of open with this because um, there's a dire need now to really prepare for the future. Um, and uh, hopefully some of you will be part of that solution. Okay. I'll talk a little bit about geriatric medicine because that's where I come from and that's, that's from where I speak, okay? Uh, geriatricians, again, are, are experts in the care of older adults. Uh, we're the experts in understanding the physiology, the medical conditions that are common in older adults, how all of those interact in a psychosocial and functional way. Um, and we're also very person-centered because we want what you want. We want you to stay healthy. Um, the goal of, uh, of our geriatricians is to increase the longevity and quality of life, and that's what I'm going to talk about tonight. Okay. I should say also, this is going to describe a little bit more about what we do, but uh, for those of you who haven't really had geriatric care, we are either internal medicine physicians or family medicine physicians that have spent an extra year in training in the care of older adults. Okay. Um, and sometimes we've had a hard time describing to people what we do because, you know, a lot of folks will say, well, I take care of every, you know, many, many doctors in the future will say, well, I'll have patient populations over 65. So what do geriatricians do? Well, we decided that we would, we would describe it in this way. First of all, we're interested in the mind. So we're experts in taking care of those with dementia, with depression, with delirium. We're interested in mobility, keeping people moving, whether it's ambulating um, or exercising or strengthening what, in whatever capacity we can. We look at medications. We are the only specialty that would prefer to take a medicine away from you than give you one. And we work very hard at doing that, okay? And what, it's a good day for us when, when your medication list, when you leave, is smaller than when you came in. And the multi-complexity of, of, of aging um, can be very uh, tremendous. If you can imagine, you know, lists of medications, you know, a few chronic illnesses, um, a few issues with function all molded together. Um, we're, we're experts in how to prioritize your care, okay? And then the best one is, is the thumb, right? What matters the most? What matters the most to you is what we're interested in. How do we put all of this together and come out with what matters uh, to you? Okay. So I'll start, a little, start talking about uh, life expectancy and longevity um, by 2040. This just came out this past week. And this top 10 list um, <clears throat> shows you the countries that have the longest life expectancy by 2040. Okay, Spain uh, will edge out Japan by 2040. Japan has been number one, followed by Singapore, Switzerland, Portugal, Italy, Israel, France, Luxembourg, and Australia. Are you looking for the United States? Yeah, yeah. it's not there. <laughs> in 2016, the U.S. ranked 43rd in the world with an average lifespan of 78.7 years. By 2040, our lifespan in general will increase by 1.1 years to 79.8, but many, many other countries will increase a lot more, so that causes us to fall to, in ranks to 64th. For all the money that we put into healthcare, all the phenomenal costs of healthcare, uh, we are not doing very well in the world market. Okay. And why is this? It's our lifestyle, okay? So the top causes of reduced longevity um, in these studies uh, are high blood pressure, high body mass index or, or being overweight, <clears throat> high blood sugar, tobacco, alcohol, and air pollution, okay? So all the money in the world, because we have quite a bit of money in this country, um, cannot compensate for our lifestyle. Okay. Of the top causes of medical conditions that affect longevity or potentially pre preventable causes of death, um, the causes um, are, are really related to smoking, diet, and exercise. 
So just imagine if we, if we could get control of our lifestyle, um, how much less cancer, less diabetes, and less cardiovascular disease we might have. Okay. All right. So, so the low-risk profile person, or the person who will have the longest um, lifespan, will be someone who never smoked, somebody who has a normal body mass, Somebody who exercises at least 30 or more minutes a day, moderate to vigorous exercise, okay? Moderate alcohol intake, and I'm gonna have to talk about that one because I don't want you leaving saying, Dr. Gibbs told me to go out and drink, okay? Um, and a high diet quality score, all right? So what this means, and particularly with the alcohol is, is Really, if you look at the Center for Disease Control, moderate means you know no more than one glass of alcohol per day for women, and two per men. Two for men, um, and I would I would add that it, it you know they say daily, but um, I think it's best to take a day or two off. Um, but really, any more than that is too much alcohol. So when they say moderate alcohol, it really does mean moderate alcohol. Okay. So what did this look like? So they, looked, they took this study and they said, well, if someone had all five of these low-risk conditions, at age 50, the, you would look at that light blue column, that person would have an average of 43 years left to live, which would put them at around 93. Um, by comparison, if you looked at the first column, if they had zero of, of those low-quality indicators, they would live another 29 years to age 79. And then everything in between is just zero, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, so by having all of these five low risk um, attributes, we would essentially add 14 years to our life, okay? And again, this says, shows, shows the same thing. There's no other, uh, there's nothing else that we can do that's quite as powerful and impactful as living a good lifestyle. And I, and I would ask you, which, which of those five factors do you think has the most impact on longevity? Okay. Smoking, exercise. How many for smoking? Okay. All right. How many for exercise? About, oh, okay. Wow. Many more for exercise. Well, it turns out that um, now physical exercise is more impactful than smoking. Okay. So it doesn't mean, it, so stop, if you do smoke, please stop, because it, it will help you um, at any age, but physical exercise is now overtaken smoking, okay? That's how important it is. So adopting a healthy lifestyle could substantially reduce premature mortality and prolong the life expectancy and get the United States back up into, you know, the top 10 in longevity <clears throat> for the world. There is actually a community nearby here in Loma Linda. Have, have you heard of the uh, Blue Zone? Yeah. So they are one of the five or six Blue Zones in the world, and Blue Zones are communities where uh, people live the longest. And they're, for the most part, Seventh-day Adventists, and they have a plant-based diet, uh, and they don't smoke. They also don't drink caffeine or alcohol, uh, but they, they, as a group, have one of the, are one of the longest living in the world. Okay. They exercise, and they are very connected to their communities. Yeah. <laughs> Well, doctors, doctors die young. I hope not. <laughs> um, I think sometimes we work too hard and we don't exercise. <laughs> How's that? So I always like to think about Hippocrates because, you know, if you think about it, um, he was the father of Western medicine. He was born around 460 AD. He lived a long life. The estimates are really 80 to 100 years of life. But what did he teach us? Okay, he taught about diet and exercise. So it just seems like the last 2,000 years we've been, we've been studying everything that he said to begin with and we've been proving Hippocrates correct. He actually said walking is man's best medicine and he was right. So after 2,000 years we finally decided. So I guess it means we're in good company um, but also means we don't need 
we don't, it's not, you know, too complex. But what it is complex is the behavior change to, to get us to the point where we take care of ourselves in the right way. So, and that's being a human being. So that's the complex part, and it's taking us a very long time to figure that out. Okay, all right. So there is a theory now, and I'm getting in, slowly getting over to the geriatrics portion of this, uh, where it's called the compression of morbidity theory, where what we'd like to do is take that first graph where somebody starts accumulating chronic disease at age 30 and then slowly builds up. Maybe they start having hypertension and then diabetes and then eventually some renal problems or kidney problems and then maybe heart failure. And, and so there's, a, there's quite a few decades there where somebody's living with disease. What we'd like to do is get people over to the right side where they live for a very, very long time with a very great quality of life and that area of morbidity or illness is very short, you know, and that's, that's our goal. This came out of um, Dr. Fries, who was um, a, one of the scientists at Stanford University, uh, probably 30, 40 years ago, and since then it's been validated over and over and over again. And the power of this model is that if you use preventative medicine, you can get to the second graph. Okay, and you can promote quality of life. People can be happier, healthier, longer. Um, and then your cost of your medical care will also decrease. So we can do more, more with our money. Okay. So we're, we're all about that, <clears throat> that short period of time. Okay. And for us, it's about function. We don't really care about age. So as a geriatrician, I know that the average age of all the patients in our clinics are around 80. Um, I don't even think of 65, 70 as really very old, uh, and none of my colleagues do. Um, so for us, we don't even think about age. What we do think about is function, okay? Now, both of these gentlemen are in town. They're getting their, probably getting their errands done. They're having a good chat. One's, one's riding a bicycle and the other is using a walker, right? So they have different medical conditions, probably different physiology, but functionally they're both doing the same. And we want, you know, and so we look at that. We don't care if one's 50 and one's 90, okay? So what we do is we look at different geriatric syndromes. And a syndrome is a clinical sort of entity that has certain signs and symptoms, has not just one cause, but many, many causes. Okay, so I'm gonna just talk a little bit about our geriatric syndromes. Uh, delirium is a syndrome where by, by people who potentially are in the hospital or after surgery can get very confused afterwards, okay? Dementia, you've all heard about, um, is you know a memory issue where people actually lose function, and there are many, many different types. Polypharmacy, all right, so the more and more medicines we add up, the longer we live, the more we go to the doctors, uh, creates this issue of polypharmacy where we have too many medicines, we have medicines that cause adverse reactions, we have medicines that are duplicative, we have medicines that we don't need, and so we're expert in taking care of that. <laughs> Elder abuse um, is also considered now a syndrome. Uh, we actually have one of the nation's first elder abuse forensic centers in Orange County. Um, the, our division coordinates the center, which is, um, which is part our participants include Adult Protective Services, the District Attorney's Office, law enforcement agencies, the courts, and so forth. So we get together and solve some of the most um, difficult types of elder abuse in the county. <clears throat> okay. Pressure sores occur for many, many reasons, but one is a problem with mobility, malnutrition, and chronic disease. Okay. Incontinence um, is a very common syndrome where people lose the ability to control the urine. Um, and again, there are many, many features there. And finally, frailty and falls, okay? So the interesting thing about this is, is that we look to the center, which is function. What do all these things do to cause people to gain function or lose function? And how do all of these circles interact with each other? And that's what we're constantly thinking about when we take care of folks. 
So let's move on a little bit to frailty. Um, and I'm going to give you a very clinical definition first and then go into what it really means in terms of one's life. Okay. So clinical syndrome in which three or more of the following criteria are present. Unintentional weight loss, self-reported exhaustion, grip strength weakness, slow walking speed, and slow physical activity. Okay. So uh, this is what we would test in the office you know, and, and decide whether or not to really give somebody that diagnosis of frailty. Okay. In real life, it's because somebody has a decline in physiological reserve and function. It's also because we lose muscle mass. It turns out that after age 40, we lose 1% of our muscle mass every single year. So by the age of 80, you've lost 40% of your muscle mass. Okay. The good news is we can do something about that. So, but the problem with frailty is we now have difficulty with independent living because it's harder to get things done. It's harder to shop. It's harder to clean house. Um, it's harder to do the laundry and, and get from your bed to the bathroom. Um, there's less ability to recover from stress, like an illness. Okay. Oftentimes people start requiring assistance for daily activities and may have impaired cognition. Um, so the real threat to us is the loss for independence. Okay, so we strive to keep people independent in our communities. And frailty is really important because when we know someone's frail, we know they have a much higher risk of falls, disability, confusion, and hospitalization, and even death. So again, you know, we look at these graphs and we want to be the one on the right side where that area of frailty is really a very short period of time. Okay. And frailty often leads to falls. And I can't tell you how de devastating falls can be to, to someone's life. Probably many of you have experienced a fall. Um, the last fall I experienced was snowboarding last year. But, uh, and it, you know, I'm, I, I thought, sure, I'm going to go back and snowboard next year. But, um, you know, having thought about that fall over and over again, I've decided that I'm probably not going to. So it, it does, it, it causes a fear of falling. The leading cause of injury and death among older adults. So of those who fall, 24% will have a serious injury. 6% will experience fractures. And many will experience less of loss of independence and fear of falling and a poor quality of life. 30% will never walk again. 30% may end up in an institution. So we do it every we can to stop the fall. We actually have a falls clinic at UCI where we look at every single aspect of multifactorial multi aspects of why falls happen. Um, so once we know somebody's starting to become frail and they start to fall, we know that some serious intervention is needed. So in terms of the biology of frail, a third to a quarter of those over 80 actually meet criteria for frailty. And again, uh, one of the key components is muscle breakdown, um, decline in mass and strength. And then it starts to become a vicious cycle and then people are, become a little malnourished and then all of a sudden you're in a vicious cycle where, you, where people get weaker and weaker and the frailty continues. Um, in terms of what's going on inside, our own stem cell, and I'll get into that in a minute, production decreases with age, and our ability to regenerate and repair our organs and tissues is compromised. Okay. All right. So we, we agree that there is much need for frailty research, and up to this point, we've been doing a lot of this with our own uh, geriatric assessment um, paradigm. So the idea would be to slow the progression. And again, up to this point, you can see that physical and lifestyle interventions are key. So what do we do to stop the loss of muscle mass? So we need to build strength. And the earlier you start, the better, OK? So I'm glad there's people of all ages here, because you know the, the people that are 30, 40, 50, and 60 need to hear this as much as 70, 80s, and 90s. Um, 
I mean, this could be the difference between p picking up your grandchild or not being able to pick up your grandchild. This could be the difference between carrying a piece of luggage onto the airplane and putting it up in the overhead bin or not being able to do that. Little things, but they make a big difference. So, so we believe in physical lifestyle intervention and for, through geriatric assessments, we've been doing this for decades. Uh, and we know that it, it works. To a certain extent, it works. Uh, one of the best trials was a FIT trial in 2013, which showed a 15% decrease in frailty over 12 months. Um, and so we believe that a multifaceted approach, meaning physical therapy, dietary services, um, good nutrition, et cetera, really do, do make a difference. And one of our clinics at UCI really specializes in this. Okay. One of the now medical or biologic approaches um, includes stem cells. And as many of you know, that these, these cells are sort of pluripotent. I mean, these cells are, have the ability to differentiate into many different types of tissues. And it turns out that mesenchymal stem cells, cells have the ability to differentiate into tissues that we need to repair organs for frailty. Okay. So this is a picture of mesenchymal stem cells <clears throat> under microscopy. Okay. So these cells um, actually come from bone marrow. Um, the ones that we are working with actually come from the bone marrow of, of healthy donors adult donors. Uh, and as you can see from this picture, you can have a mesenchymal stem cell, which it comes from something called a mesoderm line and can differentiate into many different kinds of cells. So you see bone cells on the left, endothelial cells line our blood vessels, uh, chondrocyte builds cartilage, adipocyte builds fat, odontoblast builds teeth, and neurons build our nervous system. So these stem cells have the ability to differentiate into all kinds of, kinds of different cells that would be useful if we were to repair and regenerate our organs and our tissues. Okay. So the study that we're involved in right now is actually past safety profiles and show that there's a promise of improving frailty and they study mobility and exercise uh, patient reported energy levels and biomarkers for inflammation. And there's other considerations that will be studied, including stem cells used for Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, diabetes, heart disease, rheumatoid arthritis, and so forth. Um, what's, what's really fascinating, I think, about these cells, and it's really at this point still unexplained about how they do this, is once these cells are inside, they home or they migrate to the places where they're needed. It's kind of crazy, right? But um, this just shows different parts, places in the body where these cells home to. Okay. So the, the thought is that the stem cells have anti-inflammatory properties. This is a certain theory that inflammation promotes aging. So if we fight the inflammation, we could fight the aging. Um, that these cells home to injury sites. And again, we can't really explain exactly why that happens, but we know that it happens. <clears throat> Thought that they might recruit uh, and proliferate and differentiate into the cells of the organs that we need. And they regulate the host stem cell niches through cell-cell interactions. So when they get inside, they actually communicate with the stem cells that we have. So it's pretty remarkable. Um, so, you know, so I'm, I'm about to leave this part of the talk, but um, again, I think probably a multi-pronged approach to aging, first being lifestyle, prevention, being healthy, you know, and then looking at the biological um, solution when we do get to that point in life, you know, perhaps there's a biological solution here. Okay, all right. So living healthier longer, you know, how do we do that? <clears throat> and I've really thought about three, three different, excuse me, four different um, concepts. One is resilience. It's the ability to bounce back, right? So we have the flu. We're able to bounce back and get back to where we were. We're willing to adapt. 
There's so many folks that I see that aren't willing to adapt, okay? Those that have hearing loss, they're so stubborn and they won't, they won't think about using a hearing aid, okay? That is just, what, what point is there? I don't know, I, I asked them, what point is there? You're not, you're not going to communicate with those around you. But, you know, and I can't judge because I'm, I'm not at that point, but, you know, it just seems to me that those who do adapt, those who will use the walker so they don't fall, are going to be much healthier, and they're going to live a lot longer with more function and more enjoyment. Okay. Purpose. <clears throat> so having a purpose in life is, is always key, and I think in some way that drives you forward and keeps your spirit going. And social connectedness. So in many studies, um, especially the Blue Zone studies, we find that without the social connectedness or with isolation, uh, we're robbing ourselves of years of our life. So one study actually showed that being an isolated person uh, robbed eight years in general off someone's life, overpopulation. Okay. So being involved, having purpose, adapting so you can keep living, and being resilient. So how do we do that? <clears throat> so first of all, I think we have to get back to Hippocrates, who is one of, really one of my favorite historical figures. I mean, this guy was smart, 2,000 years smart. He said it's far more important to know what person the disease has than what disease the person has. So find a doctor that sees you, not your disease. And that's, again, what we believe in. Okay. And don't think of yourself as the person with the disease. I mean, the disease. Think of yourself as the person. Okay. Keep... Keep your spirit, be ingenious and innovative. We have plenty of examples. At age 70, Ben Franklin signed the Declaration of Independence. At age 76, Nelson Mandela became the president of South Africa. At 61, Gandhi led the Salt March. At 65, Colonel Sanders started KFC. At 84, Thomas Edison invented the telephone. And at 76, Grandma Moses started painting. And she kept painting, <laughs> right? Her last painting here in, uh, at age 103. Okay. And then I, I like to look at Monet. These are, this is his art, um, if you trace it through his life. Um, I believe he was born in, in 1840. And you, know, you can see um, what we now know as Impressionism but you can see he continued to paint. This last painting was about three years before his death. But he continued to paint through visual impairment. Um, some say that he suffered from macular degeneration. But he kept painting. He kept going. And now it, seemed, it turns out that because he kept going, um, art history has now you know, something called Impressionism. And this is what it looks like. Okay. He didn't stop because he had a visual impairment. He kept painting. Exercise. So as I mentioned in the beginning, this is so critical. It doesn't matter what age you are. If you can get up and start moving, please start moving. Um, the gentleman on the left, this is, this is uh, um, a Swiss um, older gentleman um, at age 95. OK. And he kept running and racing uh, and promoting wellness and healthiness um, up until 97 when he passed away. Right? So his area of morbidity, very small. I mean, wouldn't you like to be so vital at age 97 and then you know, not have to suffer through a lot of morbidity? But he did that because he was so vigorous and so physically active. Um, so what's recommended? So is that 30 minutes a day, at least five days a week of aerobics? And that can be walking and two days a week of strength training. Again, you want to keep your muscle mass to prevent the frailty. Okay. And if you haven't exercised for a while and you're, you know, you don't want to injure yourself, I mean, that's a really good thing to think about, but go to the doctor and ask for an exercise prescription, you know? because you want to do it reasonably. You, you don't want to get injured, and there's ways to do that. Okay. Never stop learning. Um, C.S. Lewis said, you are never too old to set another goal or to dream a new dream. 
So with one out of four people in over 65 in Orange County in the coming years, you know, as a population, we have ability, abilities um, to really, fa I guess, face, you know, make the face of this county. It doesn't matter if you're 60, 70, 80, or 90. If you've always wanted to do something, it's time to do it. Okay, but these are the things that will keep aging, you know, and keep frailty away. It's the activity, it's the, you know, the learning. Um, and this is one of my favorite people, because um, she was a bit zany and crazy. Um, she said, I'd rather regret the things I've done than regret the things I haven't done. And uh, I usually try to follow the rules, but now I try to to go by the maximum of asking for uh, forgiveness than permission. Um, it's a little bit out of my comfort zone, but I figure that's my way of preventing a lot of aging. Um, so, you know, with this, I hope I've given you a, um, an idea of, you know, what longevity is, what contributes to preventable causes, how can we stay healthy, how can we prevent the onset of frailty as long as possible. And I say it's never too early to start, okay, never too late to start. Okay, and to let you know about some of, the, some of the thought behind preventing frailty. So again, it's for me, it's first prevention, lifestyle. But also we believe in the technical, you know, in the advances that are occurring now. So we are, we are hosting a stem cell trial in our clinic, which, and the information um, we have at the back table if you're interested in that. Um, and so, um, again, we believe in, in longevity and quality of life and in geriatricians and um, geriatric medicine. So I hope I've sort of imparted some of that to you tonight. Um, I will uh, just leave you with some upcoming events, um, including a lot of um, information about stem cell research at UC Irvine coming up in the next year. Okay. And there, again, there's information in the back regarding that. Uh, and then I'll just close with a picture of our hospital um, and invite any questions you may have. So, yes. What area of geriatrics do you think is most in need of research? So, can you repeat that one more time? Yeah, I, I asked, what area of geriatrics is most in need of a research program? Wow, that's a great question. I think, um, I mean, right now, the things that, that I can think of first are the things that we're involved in. Um, and one of, one of them is dementia care. Um, you know, how do you care for patients with dementia with, you know, with the latest in technology, latest in science, but with compassion um, and involve our community? So we're involved in that now. I think since there's so few geriatricians that one of the things we're about is, is training. And so we're training many, many, many primary care physicians throughout the county in geriatric care. And we actually have Amy here tonight who's one of our gerontology experts uh, working on that project. Um, we're also involved in um, linking, how do you link health systems to the community? Because we find that, you know, we can, we can do only so much in the doctor's office. And then we need to link out the community to make sure other things are happening. And oftentimes that communication doesn't happen. Uh, so we're, we're developing some software now so that that communication can happen. And we're testing that out. Um, you know, I think stem cells have a lot of opportunity and promise. Um, and I also think that, you know, the area of mental health in aging is an area that, that we need a lot of research in. Um, so, I don't know if you're looking for something specific, but... No, if I could be permitted an observation. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is, I wonder how much your talk would have been different 15 years ago. And that concerns me. Mm -hmm. uh, that... Uh, in this area of growth in our county and everywhere mm -hmm. that we're not putting the resources into these uh, practical, appropriate mm -hmm. uh, questions, uh, rather being uh, taken over by the glamorous stem cell research for which payoff still is in the future. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, and I think that... Um 
you know, the areas of research that have really taken off in the last few years are the areas in falls research, um, the areas in when do you stop screening for older adults, like when do you stop screening for PSAs and mammograms and so forth, when does it not make, make no longer make a difference. Um, certainly areas in how to identify frailty, areas in how you validate screening instruments to identify fall risk. Um, so we've done a lot of groundwork in establishing geriatrics as a field. Um, and so we've done a lot of research in geriatric assessment. Um, we, you know, in terms of working with other professionals, physical therapists and so forth. So our research is not normally that sort of flashy, glamorous research. Um, the stuff that we do is pretty cognitive, and, but, but it's okay, it makes sense for us because uh, at the end of the day, we feel like a lot of the solutions, you know, are the ones that make sense. Um, you know, for us, you know, the stem cell is an exciting, new, innovative venture, and so I think it's definitely worth talking about, um, but, but you're right. I mean, in terms of the last few years and decades of research, we've been establishing geriatrics as a field, and really identifying what aging means and how you identify it and how you recognize it and then what you do about it. So. Thanks. I've heard that with um, repeated stem cell treatments, the, uh, uh, there's a decrease in effectiveness. Mm -hmm. Is there any truth to that? I, that's a great question, and I would have to defer that because I, you know, again, I'm, I, I'm new to the uh, stem cell research, so I haven't used or been involved with this before, but we certainly have experts at the Stem Cell Institute that we can talk to and okay. give you a better answer. Hopefully your study will extend and you can find out. Yes, absolutely. And I have yeah. a couple more. When, oh, go when, ahead. Are you ready? Okay. Um, what about uh, stem cell uh, treatments of this type mm -hmm. uh, in a, a, you know, before frailty to prevent frailty? I, so I think, yeah, that, so this, oh yeah, I'm sorry, so I'm sorry. Yeah, I haven't been following your directions. Uh, so the question was, how about stem cell treatments to prevent, so even prior to this, to prevent the onset of frailty? Um, and the, I think the answer is we just don't know because this right now is the cutting edge. So at least I think we want to find out whether it has an effect when we know there's frailty first before we start talking about preventing frailty. I'll volunteer. Okay. <laughs> And last little thing, what, uh, in your uh, study for frailty, what mm -hmm. other positive effects are you expecting or so, looking for? Right, so um, what other effects um, would we be looking for in, this, in the study for frailty? Sure, so an increased walking speed, for instance, better strength, um, uh, self-report of more energy, and there's a certain biomarkers in the, in the blood, the laboratory values that we're looking for. Hello. Um, what percentage of the elderly, I don't know how to define that, let's say 75 years and above, mm -hmm. would have um, memory difficulties and how can we help an older adult, uh, specifically short-term memory, long-term memory doesn't seem to be affected I'm thinking mm -hmm. of my mother, mm -hmm. um, but how can we keep uh, the short-term memory more um, better? Okay, so so the, I guess the the question really is like, what is the prevalence of memory problems in people over seventy-five, and what can we do about it? Right. So it, it looks like in people over 80, almost 40% will have, can have some type of memory issues or cognitive problems. Um, you know, again, I go back to lifestyle and prevention because we're having more and more studies come out that show if we control our blood pressure in young and middle age, we can stave off dementia. And it may not be all dementias, but we're thinking that, you know, rather than having pure Alzheimer's or pure vascular, 
a lot of dementia is mixed. So in a lot of dementias, you'll have vascular problems, and that means that you've potentially someone's had blood pressure problems for the last 20 to 30 years. Our blood vessels get stiff, and then our, the blood that we need to provide the nutrients to all of the little cells way down the line just don't get there. So those little areas kind of atrophy. So if we control our blood pressure and exercise, and avoid diabetes and all of these things, you know, what we're seeing now is that we can likely prevent or really stave off dementia for a long time. So that, that's what we can do in our lifetime. Uh, in terms of treating dementia, um, there are some medications that are approved for dementia. Um, they're not curative. Um, and in some people, we find that they actually have results so that people tend to be more alert and more responsive. Um, and in other people, they don't seem to do very much at all. So, you know, instead of promoting medicine as the first course, it's certainly part of, part of a treatment plan. Um, but we like to see exercise. We like to see, you know, appropriate caregiving, education for caregivers. Um, and then to be as mentally and st uh, stimulated as much as possible. So, yeah. How do, you, how do you motivate someone who is reticent to exercise and never has? Well, that's the million dollar question. <laughs> so. <laughs> How, so how do you motivate somebody to exercise who has no interest in exercising, right? <laughs> That's why we're here 2,000 years later with the same, the same observations that Hippocrates had. Um, in 460 AD. And that's just, that's behavior change, but it's culture. I mean, look at the, the countries that are on the top 10 on longevity. They're more active, you know, it's a culture. Um, but also, you know, as physicians, we employ, you know, lots of tricks of the trade to really try to find out what's important to people. You know, is it important to you to be able to, to lift your grandchild in the next two, three years? Then you, then you need to start building your muscles, you know. You need to c continue to be active so that you can, you can really enjoy your time with them. You know, or it may be something else, but we try to understand what's important to somebody and then just try to say, look, you know, in order to keep that going, this is really what we think you need to do. Um, and so it's, uh, it's behavior change, but behavior change turns out to be one of the hardest things about medicine. <laughs> so. I have a second question. How do you define a high di diet quality score? And yeah. does someone that's not inter I'm not hungry and doesn't eat very much, does that affect cognition? I don't think that affects, so the, the question is what is a high quality diet score and I knew somebody was gonna ask that. So I think, I think in general that means, you know, less refined sugars, less refined carbohydrates, probably maximizing the fish over the meat and the vegetables and, you know, more vegetables than fruit. Some of the things that, we, that we've grown up knowing about. If you look at the blue zone areas, they really believe in a plant-based diet. So it probably means a little bit different things to different people, but in general it's that, is that the, the sort of healthy concepts. The fact that, um, so you're asking, you don't have a very healthy or hearty appetite it's not me. Oh, if somebody <laughs> doesn't have. <laughs> yes. My mom says, I'm just not hungry. I eat one meat. She eats breakfast, and she'll have chocolates throughout the day. But, oh. you know, yeah. she's just not hungry and not interested in eating. And I don't know how to okay. do that, how to make that, her eat more. <laughs> that's not that uncommon, actually. Um, what we try to do is at least the calories that she will eat to have those be healthy um, and, and increase your activity level, if that's possible. That's true. You know? That's true. If you exercise, if you exercise, if you exercise, <laughs> you know, and start some weightlifting, you'll build some muscle and, you, you know, you'll need more calories. Um, but it's really that mobility. I would get the mobility moving first and then hopefully the appetite would follow.
You didn't mention sleep as an important component. Mm -hmm. Is that because you found out it isn't? No, it's because in this in the study that I quoted, they 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 named the top five or six, which the six being air pollution. Um, and I don't know if it's because they didn't study sleep or they didn't look at it, but I agree with you that sleep is incredibly important. Um, sleep is important to, to stave off depression. Um, a lot of people think sleep is very important um, to, to, I wouldn't say prevent dementia, but at least to reduce that contribution to cognitive impairment. Um, but it, yeah, exactly. It's, I think it's critically important. Thank you, a very good presentation. So you said that we are have shortage in uh, geriatric doctors, mm -hmm. but we have a lot of new gerontologists people in the field. How do you guys work together? Um, how do we can help? Okay, so people that study gerontology, uh -huh. so Because which I see that you focus on a lot of the social um, situation for the family, mm -hmm. part of the medicine, and mm -hmm. gerontology is focused in the social. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like there is the same mm -hmm. the thing. Can you give me a little more explanation of each one, sure. what they do, and how it can work together? Sure, that's a great question. So I mentioned the the um, the dearth of geriatricians, but it's, it's actually true that let me just expound on that a little bit. So asking about how gerontologists and geriatricians can work together. So gerontology in general is the study of aging and geriatrics is the study of aging and medicine. Um, so we love our gerontologists. Um, our gerontologist, in fact, Amy's a gerontologist, right? Look at Amy. <laughs> so you could probably answer this question too. So Amy works on one of our grants that helps us um, train primary care physicians in the community. We have other gerontologists in our program that work in elder abuse. Um, we know many gerontologists that work in assisted living facilities and daycare centers, um, and even the Alzheimer's you know, programs, Alzheimer's OC. So we, we work with gerontologists all of the time. So absolutely. We just, in, in our program, anybody who wants to study aging and, and loves the study of aging, um, we can find a, a way to work with them um, because the community, again, is so important to what we do uh, that it's not hard to find. And here, I think Amy's going to add something to that. <laughs> you know, when you think about children, um, you can think of education with children and the health for children and and there are all these programs for children it's the same thing with geriatrics um, we need to create those programs in our community and UCI is a, doing a great job with that um, but it extends beyond medicine it extends into um, their social work it extends into um, nutrition and fitness and I mean it it goes beyond just health it goes into other professions too. And so they're all interconnected and it's like a web. Um, and if we create that um, safety net of support, then we can all help one another. Hello, um, I'm a licensed clinical social worker and I've been in geriatrics for probably about 21 years. So my question is, I'm an inpatient outpatient. Mm -hmm. I go into long-term care communities, retirement communities, assisted living, skilled nursing, and then we also have people that come to our offices. How often are you seeing today, at least on the West Coast, an integration of primary care and mental health? Mm -hmm. I see it a lot more often, mm -hmm. I think, on the East Coast than we do here. Mm -hmm. Do you see that a burgeoning field, or do you, do you yeah. what, I, what are your thoughts about that? Okay, so um, how we embed um, allied professionals, including licensed clinical social workers, into our into our healthcare. So at our senior health center, actually, we're very good at doing that. Um, in fact, we've we've you'll you'll understand what an impact program I think is, where you actually embed a psychologist or a licensed clinical social worker into the primary care clinic. Uh, we've had that in the past, and we're 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 looking to bring that back. Uh, but, but another example um, is at UCI, we're starting to look at a lot of population health, um, and I'm very involved in that. And so we're starting to, to build out on a geriatrics foundation. 
And so in our intensive care team, we have a licensed clinic social worker, we have another uh, MSW, um, and we have health coaches. And I, I can tell you that will be the backbone of this program. So um, our licensed clinical social worker, in fact, has been in, inside of our clinic for the last 10 years. Um, and it's incredibly useful because she understands the medical diagnoses and we understand what social work is. Uh, and we all work together just seamlessly. Let, let's thank Dr. Gibbs for coming right. here tonight and, and speaking to us. And thank you. Having so much patience.